Well, good morning, Kettlebrook in both West Bend and Jackson. Uh, Troy and Ryan here with you this morning. And this is unique. This is something we've never done before, uh, something we've never had to do before as we gather here at the Kettlebrook Community Center. Um, those of you who are not sitting in your normal seats, either in West Bend or in Jackson, may be, uh, maybe a little... Uh, uneasy about what's going on, but we're hoping that you're in your home uh, somewhere and you're able to engage with us this morning. Uh, if you haven't seen it, we sent out a communication via email. It's also on Facebook yesterday as to where we are relative to the COVID-19 uh, epidemic and what is going on and why we are here this morning, which is really to care for those who are vulnerable in our midst and make sure that... Um, uh, those who have compromised immune systems and those who are elderly will not be exposed to this. And so we are speaking to an empty uh, community center right now, minus Paul Fisher, who is helping us out with sound and the camera. But um, nonetheless, we, we, can, we have to see this as a great opportunity, right, Ryan, to, right. to practice what we have spoken about almost every Sunday for the last 15 years, which is the church is not a place it's not something that you go to. It is not a time of the week. Uh, we are the church. Mm. You are the church. We are the church, and the church is gathering this morning. It's gathering all over the world. Uh, I know that President Trump has declared today as a national day of prayer, and it should be, and we're going to talk about prayer a little bit later. But um, again, we see this as a great opportunity. Uh, we know that there's a lot of things we want to process through with you this morning. This is going to be a little bit different than typical gathering. Obviously, we don't have a music worship team at either site, and uh, we're not going to be preaching in the same sense that we typically do. We want to create more of a dialogue and a discussion with each other and with you as we navigate uh, the times that we are in. And so with that in mind, uh, we'd ask you to follow along with us. There's going to be times where you're going to maybe hit pause and think and reflect or discuss some things if you're with a group or, or journal things if you're by yourself. But um, to open our time together, obviously we need to bring ourselves before the Lord. And so I'd ask Ryan, why don't you, why don't you kick us off uh, with our hearts before the Lord as we pray together. Yeah. Yeah, welcome again, family. Let's um, honor Jesus and invite him to speak to our hearts through the Spirit, through prayer. So Father, these are uh, unique times as Troy mentioned. And, and these are times where... Um, our adversary, the enemy, would want to get us to um, live in panic, to live in fear, to live in isolation, uh, both spiritually, uh, physically, emotionally. And yet, God, uh, these are times also where you have not changed, mm -hmm. where you say your son Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change like the shifting shadows. Um, he is strong. He is the same, and we can trust in him with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding and all our ways acknowledge him that he would make our path straight. So, Father, um, for this morning and for the foreseeable future, we just ask that your spirit would affirm who you are, whose we are, and that we would be strong and courageous knowing you will never leave or forsake us even now. Yes. And we ask God to uh, bless this time in the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah. Amen. 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 At this time, what you will see is we're going to bring in a video link to uh, a song that we'd love you to sing uh, with us. Uh, if, again, if you're by yourself, um, feel free. If you're with a group, uh, feel free to do that as well. It's a song that we've been singing recently called Only a Holy God. It's a newer mm -hmm. song uh, by City of Light. And so take a look at this video and please uh, sing along as we open and worship through song. Who else can make every king? 
So, this past week, Ryan and I had prepared messages. Uh, we actually had two different parables that we we're going to be teaching from in both Jackson and West Bend. And uh, as the week progressed and as things kind of kept coming at us and, and, and at all of us, we did something we've never done before, which was we said, hey, we're going to, we've always felt like we really need to stick to whatever text we've got. And this, this, this is the first time ever in 15 years we said we really need to pause and a, specifically address the situation uh, because of the amount of us that's quite frankly it's impacting it's impacting all of us mm -hmm. and so we had the series we're going through vintage Jesus we're looking at the parables uh, of Jesus but um, this morning we want to talk about how we are to, we're called to respond as a family of faith in the midst of uh, what we're experiencing with this virus how are we called to respond as followers of Jesus now, um, before we get into that, we actually want to give you a chance to interact with this idea because uh, we recognize that um, there's probably some things that you might feeling, be feeling some anxiety about. There might be some fears that you have. Mm -hmm. And so we want you to take some time now. There's going to be uh, a question that comes up on your screen now asking basically what are some of the anxieties or fears that you're experiencing. We'd like you to, to, to again, if you're alone, to take some time to reflect on that, write that down or journal it perhaps. Uh, if you're with a group, share those things. Um, and so we're going to give you some time to do that, and then we're going to come back into uh, God's Word and process through what He has to say to us as, and how we are to respond in this. So take some time now. Take as much time, quite frankly, as you need to, to dialogue with, with us, with one another in this, and then we'll come back and we'll actually share as well some things that we're um, processing through. So take some time now to do that. All right, Ryan, you and I talked through this. Um, you know, we're not exempt from or immune to having some anxiety ourselves, if we're really honest. I think we'd be lying to us and ourselves and to everyone else if we said we're not sometimes feeling anxious about certain things. Right. The questions that we had asked uh, of each other is, hey, what are you feeling anxious about in mm -hmm. this time, if anything? And, and um, do you want to share some things that kind of yeah. come from, from your heart? Yeah, I, I think we had shared that one of the things that, that I would be fearful of is that myself and that we could kind of uh, take this time and, and make it about us mm. and in fear um, make it uh, isolation, safety, comfort rather than leaning into, really leaning into what God might have for us in these upcoming days. That was one. Yeah, so I mean literally having a fear going, we are not called to walk by the flesh, but boy is it easy to try to do that at this time. Like yeah. if when the rubber really meets the road, right. if we're honest, there could be some anxiety around a fear of, of really being uh, self, of self preservation, being the utmost uh, idolatry that we would have at this time. I, right. I would agree with that. Yeah. I also, I think I have a fear of being reactive versus proactive. It seems like so much stuff is coming at us that I almost feel forced to be reactive, and I, I don't like that. I like to be more in control, and I feel completely out of control sometimes, yeah. and quite frankly, behind the eight ball quite a bit uh, on, on what's happening next and how do we make sure that we, we navigate this well. So that's a fear I know that, that I, you know, is, is underlying there a little bit, try to wrestle through that. Yeah, for sure. Another fear that we had discussed was just we, we feel like this will probably affect people we know and love and care in this family and outside of this family, whether that be physically mm. and with sickness, whether that be financially and in job loss or financial hardship, uh, whether that be emotional with not knowing what's next and not being able to control anything and grasping at control. Uh, we feel like this will affect our family and those outside of our family. Yeah. Uh, we also talked about how there's a reality of the fear. We, we wrote about it, we keep talking about it, and we believe it, but it's, we want to respond in, in faith and not in fear. And, and so sometimes I feel like, oh, Jesus, are you saying to me, oh, ye of, of little faith, uh, are, are we... Are we responding with enough faith, quite frankly? And that's, that's something I'm a little bit anxious about to say. I really don't want to respond in fear at all, uh, yeah. in spite of sometimes the flesh that would may, maybe draw us that way. So those are some of the things that I know that we're wrestling through. Mm -hmm. um, and there's probably a list of other things that you expressed, maybe some of the same, maybe some very different. But um, to that end, we want to process through what does this look like? And what does Scripture have to say? So Ryan, you, you want to open us up with this and talk about... Um, yeah. How do we deal with some of these fears and anxieties? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, if you think about the scriptures and you think about following Jesus and what he calls us to and what he calls us away from, you might be surprised to know that repeatedly time and time again in the scriptures, uh, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, 
But in the New Testament, over 70 times, he says, do not be afraid. And I think the reason he says that is because when we're in a state of fear and stay in that state of fear, we're really depending upon ourselves. Yeah. And it's really self-focused. But when we turn from our fear and turn in faith to him, it's really about dependence upon the only one who's worthy of our dependence, and that's Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, in saying that, what we're not saying is that we won't be in, at different times and for different reasons afraid, right? We're not saying that. That's just natural. We're hardwired to feel that fear. So it's not will we be afraid, it's what do we do with that fear when we are afraid. And so what we're going to try and encourage each other to do in the coming days and however um, long that we are in this situation is to turn from fear to faith. And though we're not gathered together in Jackson and West Bend, we can still rely each o- on each other as brothers and sisters in Christ that when we're fearful to turn to f- each other and point each other back to Jesus. Yeah, I mean, if ever there's a time for kind of gospel fluency in the midst of how is the gospel good news, um, to fear specifically right now is a time for us to be practicing that with one another because we need to be reminded of it ourselves and we need to be reminding uh, each other of yeah. it as well. Yeah, and parents, what an opportunity to process with our kids about the situation and turning in faith to Jesus also. Um, there are um, several interesting things about it. The, as we said, the, the Bible is not saying we don't need to be or shouldn't ever be afraid of it, but it's how we handle that. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says this, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and of self-discipline. And so what we'd like to do now is we'd like to turn and have you turn in your own Bibles to Mark chapter 3. And what we're going to do is we're just going to take a few moments, a few minutes, and have you hit the pause and have you reflect on Mark chapter 3 verses 7 to 10 and just ask a a couple simple questions. Um, What is this text revealing about God and what might God be saying to us through this text. This is just what we've done on a gathering and uh, in the past, over this past series, and this is a way you could do this even post these times where we're gathering in our homes when you spend time with God yourselves. Uh, What does this text say about God? What is this text saying to us, and what should we do about it? So we just want to give you a few minutes to either as an individual or a family who's gathered together to look at those verses in Mark. Well, we hope that you had a chance to not only read through the text, maybe read through it a number of times and actually maybe even process together as a group some things that popped out relative to those questions about uh, what does this text say about God and and what is God saying to us in this text. Uh, What we're going to do now is I want to read it. I know you've already read it. We're going to read it again. Um, This is Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. This text was brought to me this week. I've just had so many things come across my inbox. And again, as we were wrestling through the Luke 11 text that I was going to preach and the other text that you were preaching, uh, this one, uh, I think Carr mentioned this one. And, um, and so it just has come to mind at the top of mind as we've been thinking through uh, of this weekend. So it says this, Jesus had in chapter 3 at the beginning, he had uh, healed a man on the Sabbath. And um, uh, beyond that, We see this right after this. Chapter 3, verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from uh, the surrounding areas, which is in there. Verse 9. And because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many so so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Again, you've already had a chance to think through and process through this, but uh, one, of the, one of the things we wanted to, there's a couple of things we wanted to point out about this text that sticks out. One is that uh, Jesus, you, you see in this text, Jesus, people are constantly coming to touch him, right? Sick people here specifically, crowds of sick people are pressing in, in, in a more literal translation, it says that, that he basically had to get a boat ready for him so that the people would not crush him because they mm. were trying to, to touch him because what was happening is that people were touching him, they were being healed, right? Mm. And so I don't know if, I don't know about you, Ryan, but I think we talked about this and I, I think both of us had said, hey, if we're one of the 12 disciples and we're with Jesus 
And there's just sick people everywhere around. We're kind of, at some point, are we not like, hey, Jesus, do you want to time out on this one? Like, this is, this is really dangerous. Can we all get sick? And maybe they had seen him heal people and they thought, well, if we get sick, he'll heal us. I don't know. Right. But what we do consistently see here is that there's this pattern of Jesus touching sick people. I mean, he had touched lepers and those who were unclean. And according to the Jewish tradition, there was a lot of ways you could be unclean, and including dead and, and menstrual stuff. I mean, like all kinds of things that would make people unclean to some extent. And Jesus was willing to, to touch on all of them and let them touch him. And so we see that. Now we also see something interesting here. He says, because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him. Uh, you know, it's like, hey guys, we're going to, you know, we're going to get away a little bit. And there's times where Jesus took his disciples and he withdrew. Uh, I don't know if we can uh, pro uh, properly ap uh, apply that in this text to say, hey, based on our uh, coronavirus situation, what do we do? Do we come up and let everyone touch us? Do we run away in a boat? I, I think neither of those is the, the, really what we're going for here. What we're trying to make a point of is to say, <laughs> there are times to withdraw and there are times to engage. Uh, it seems as though there's more engaging than withdrawing, although there's times to make sure that they're rested and ready for ministry and for the work that they're called to by the Spirit of God. But it's, it's how are we willing to kind of get engaged with uh, and bring the kingdom into uh, illness uh, and, and beyond, right? Yeah, yeah and, and we would see in that, and not just this passage, but other passages, that Jesus would continually challenge the cultural and social norms. Yes. Right? It, whether it be religious or just cultural, because his kingdom turned those upside down. Yes. And so, yeah, Jesus would do that, and we'll see that, whether it be his early disciples here or those after that you're going to talk about, that they just knew that intrinsically. And following Jesus, that's what it meant. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So, so we find this, and, and um, this is kind of where things, this is Jesus and his disciples, and they're seeing him do this, and we watch this play out in the early church. We watch it continuously play out in the early church. What we wanted to do was take a little bit of a tour historically with you through some of what we've seen the church, how we've seen the church respond in times like this. And so I have to take my notes up because this is just a bunch of history that I didn't memorize, uh, walk you through this. But here, here's some, some stats, for example. In uh, 165 to 180 AD, there was a plague called the Antonine Plague. Okay, it was uh, believed to be a smallpox epidemic in the Roman Empire at that time. Five million people lost their lives in that 15-year period. About 100 years later, the plague of Cyprian, which was 251 to 266 AD, had uh, such devastating effects that at, the, at its height, there were 5,000 people per day losing their lives in the city of Rome. And, and I, don't, I don't give you those examples to say, wow, you know, to compare it to, to freak anybody out. I say this, was the, this is the reality historically of what happened. And what was amazing was then the, the, the response of the church and how different it was from those who were pagans at the time or considered pagans at the time who were really, their, their goal was to remove themselves as far away from the sick as they possibly could, leave, uh, run away if you could. The Christians, however, responded very differently. In fact, we find uh, Rodney Stark uh, wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity, and it says um, this about Dionysius, who was the bishop uh, of Alexandria at, this, uh, at the time of one of these. Acknowledging the huge death rate, Dionysius noted that though this terrified the pagan, Christians greeted the epidemic as merely schooling and testing. Thus, at a time when all other faiths were called into question, Christianity offered explanation and comfort. Even more important, Christian doctrine provided a prescription for action. And so instead of running away uh, from in, in fear, it was people daily taking up their cross in fairly radical ways to, to love and serve those who were suffering. Mm -hmm. in, in, in need. So um, Dionysius pays tribute to those um, when he writes this. He's, he himself says, this is the bishop again of Alexandria, says, most of our uh, Christian brethren uh, showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed this life serenely happy, for they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pain. I mean, Ryan, that sounds pretty crazy, right? Yeah. It's, it's a crazy response. He goes on to say, many in nursing and curing others transferred their deaths to themselves 
and died in their stead. And we know why they did that because they followed the one who, that's exactly what he did for us is he died in our stead to save us from our sins, right? Yeah, amen. Outside of him, it makes absolutely no sense because no one would do that. Why would you do that? Yeah. Excuse me. Candida Moss, a professor of New Testament and early Christianity at Notre Dame, notes this. An epidemic that seemed like the end of the world actually promoted the spread of Christianity. By their actions in the face of possible death, Christians showed their neighbors that Christianity is worth dying for. So the same thing, the same thing, different followers of Jesus, different time periods, same response. Well, and even it wasn't even that Christianity itself was worth dying for, right? Right. It's that the leader of the Christian church, Christ himself, was the one who people were giving their lives for. Yeah. Because he had given their lives for them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and you fast forward to the 300s and the Christian History Institute cites that Already in 312, during a widespread plague, Christians in many eastern cities were performing similar tasks. In the face of epidemics, they seem often to have formed ambulance corps, making up for municipal authorities' failure to help the sick and the dying. And in 362 AD, a case has been made that the Emperor Julian wrote these words. I think that when the poor happened to be neglected and overlooked by our priests, the impious Galileans observed this and they devoted themselves to benevolence. The impious Galileans support not only their poor, but ours as well, and everyone can see that our people lack aid from us. And we know who these Galileans were, right? They were the followers of Jesus yeah. in that time period, in that place. Yeah, and you could keep going. And we're gonna jump, make a jump and skip to uh, Martin Luther, for example, during the bubonic plague uh, in 1527, the plague strikes Wittenberg, his town, he was ordered uh, by the, the prince of the town, I think is what they call it at the time, to leave. He did not leave. He stayed. Uh, the, the, another leader in town, I think they called the mayor, his wife actually kind of died in his arms as he was serving her and caring for her. It's, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. But he was basically, he and a group of other followers of Jesus said, we're going to stay in this and we're going to minister at the, at the cost of, at the sa- for the sake of our own lives, yeah. for, the, for the sake of the others. So it's, it's amazing. And we, and we could go on. I, I, I want to change gears just a little bit because I want to throw in a little bit something about St. Patrick. I love to do that uh, this time of year. St. Patrick's Day is a Tuesday, right? Um, not at all had to, having to do with a, an epidemic, but St. Patrick, who we all know was from, uh, not Ireland. Uh, he was from <laughs> England. Uh, he was taken captive and made a slave uh, by Druids who had, who had stolen him from England and made him serve uh, over in Ireland. He escapes he goes back to England, is, meets the, li- the living God, gives his life to Jesus Christ, and then hears God's call to go back and minister to and serve and share the gospel with those who had enslaved him. Mm-hmm. It's, it's an amazing story. And then leprechauns jumped out of everywhere. It was gold. <laughs> it was amazing. So, no. Um, so, so you just kind of keep going. And we even think, fast forward, even to this current situation in Wuhan, mm-hmm. where, Wuhan, China, where this whole thing began. You were talking about this the other day, Ryan. Yeah, there's reports of the followers of Jesus in Wuhan going out in the streets, handing out face masks and, and sharing the love of Jesus with people. Um, we read that members of one Chinese church in Wuhan have been ministering to medical personnel, delivering food and supplies to a quarantine family, leading a dying woman who is visiting Wuhan to Christ, and then filming her memorial service for her family back home. And again, that's amazing, right? Mm-hmm. Isn't that amazing? I mean, the, they are living out their faith in Jesus in sacrificial ways, irregardless of the cost to themselves. And mm-hmm. now what we're not suggesting, what we're not stating is to run out and allow people to cough on you and share germs and all sorts of things. There's, there's wisdom if the, with this. We're not calling you to recklessness, but we are inviting each other to sacrificial service in the way that Jesus sacrificially served us. Acts 17, chapter 6 states this. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. And they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king, Jesus. And family, what we want to encourage you and invite you to is is to be just like that great cloud of witnesses that Hebrews talks about that came before us who in essence through Jesus Christ and living out his kingdom values have turned the world upside Mm. down. I mean, what an opportunity if ever presented itself that we could literally point people to Jesus and his kingdom that turned the world upside down in maybe unprecedented ways 
than we've been able to in here in our context where sometimes it's a little bit comfortable, sometimes it's a little bit familiar, yeah. right? Well, we might have op ample opportunities in the coming days and weeks ahead to point people to Jesus, the one who can bring peace in the midst of a time that's not peace, the one who can bring calm in the t midst of a time that's full of fear, mm -hmm. the one who's the king of kings and lord of lords. Yeah, I mean, it certainly feels as though the coronavirus has turned the world upside down. But in reality, we are called to be a people who, I guess, turn the world right side up, if you would, mm -hmm. and, and display the kingdom in such amazing ways in the midst of what seems to be a tumultuous time. So um, in the midst of those things, those are some thoughts we want you to be processing through. Um, there's some postures that we'd like to, to present to you that we as a family would like to hold. And uh, we have four different postures or thoughts around this. They all start with P because they have to be assimilated. They have to start with the same letter. Um, that's a joke. But <clears throat> the first one is people. And when we think about a posture towards people, we need to be reminded that, that all humanity is made in the image of God. Um, our understanding of, of why we care about people, how we look at others is based on our belief that humanity is uniquely different than all of other, all the rest of creation because we have been made in the image of God. Yeah. And that's every person, every human. And so when we think about how do we make decisions around, well, I want this or I need this or, you know, I don't care about that or I do care about this. Every human we need to look at. And so our, we need to take a posture towards people. Uh, thinking of yeah. them as made in the image of God. Yeah. Um, Jesus Christ was, he came as in human flesh, took on flesh in yeah. the incarnation. So people. The second one is um, peace, right, Ryan? Yeah. We want to be a people of peace. Yeah, Jesus said that um, my peace I give to you, but not as the world gives. So we have peace with God eternally through our faith in him that our sins are forgiven, but we can also have peace right here and now, even in the midst of any and every circumstance, not based on circumstance, but based on walking with and knowing and hearing from and being led by Jesus right in the midst of this. Yeah, and peace is one of the fruit of the Spirit, which we're going to come back to in a minute. Yeah. So people, peace, a big one that we had to throw in because I couldn't think of another word that starts with P is uh, propitiation, <laughs> which is really means sacrifice. Uh, Jesus' uh, sacrifice is called a propitiation where he uh, took our place. And so the idea is how do we be a people of sacrifice? How do we think sacrificially in terms of our time, of our money, of our goods, of our, uh, of our heart towards others? How do we creatively become people of sacrifice in a time like this. That's something that we're going to have to actually have to learn from one another in because we've got so many different minds together as a family that there's going to be creative ways that we're able to love and serve. In fact, that's already been coming to us. Some people have said, hey, here's some ideas that we have how we think we can serve in the midst of this. It's been, it's been amazing. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I know we've reached out to some of the city leaders here in our community to say, hey, we want to be available to do just that. If mm -hmm. and when, if anything happens, we'd like to be ready. Kettlebrook as a family wants to be ready to serve you as you lead uh, our, our larger community. So we've done some of that. So people, peace, propitiation or sacrifice, and then prayer. Uh, certainly ne not least, but it is last in here for a reason. We want to have prayer. We talked about at the beginning of the year, prayer being a focus. And boy, the Lord has uh, certainly drawn us near to prayer in many ways this year. He's answered some ridiculous, crazy prayers that we have asked. We've seen him do some amazing things. And so we want to be a people of prayer. We need to be a people of prayer in the midst of this. So um, a couple of things that I want to be in prayer for is if we look at Luke uh, chapter 11, which I, I, you don't even necessarily have to turn to it. It, it may be on the screen uh, in front of you, um, but it may not. Here's what we're going to talk about today a little bit, and, and I don't want to talk a lot about it because we don't have a lot of time, but what Jesus does, he, he shares the Lord's Prayer, and then he gives a parable on prayer where there's uh, someone who is home with this, uh, and, and he's woken up by a friend who comes to visit him, and uh, in that culture, there would have been some need for hospitality for that traveler or visitor who was coming into the house. Uh, the guy doesn't have any food to give the guy. So he then, the owner of the house, goes to the neighbor next door and says, wakes him up. It's midnight. Says, hey, can you give me some food? I got a, a, a visitor, a guest who I need to provide for. And the guy in the other house uh, who's sleeping says, I can't get out of bed. Leave me alone, basically. And the guy at the door keeps knocking. And eventually, because of his persistence and his boldness, He's like, i got to get up. He's going to mm -hmm. wake up the whole neighborhood. So he gets up and um, he does that. Now Jesus goes on then to say, um, if we, we basically ask God, he's not going to be like, oh, you better, you know, you know I'm not going to get up and help you. He will. 
and, and uses another illustration to say, hey, if, if, if your son comes to you and asks you for bread, are you going to give him a stone? Um, if he comes for, and asks you for some fish, are you going to give him a snake? He's like, no, you're not going to do that. And then Jesus says, if, if you as fathers who are sinners, if you would, or who are evil, if, you're, if you evil, evil people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father know how to give you good gifts? And he says this at the end. He says, uh, how much more, in verse 13 of chapter 11, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Earlier on, he had said, you know, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Okay, does that give us a, a ticket? And Jesus is saying, ask for whatever you want and it will be given to you. Well, you're like, uh, Jesus, that doesn't seem to work because I've asked for a lot of things you haven't given to me. And it's interesting because he comes back here and he says, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so a couple things from this I, I want us to learn from, and that is we need to be a people who are in prayer boldly. We need to be praying boldly, family. For us to be praying boldly uh, means that we just, we're persistent in prayer, that we keep coming. This is obviously a time we need to be in prayer. We always do, but boy, it sure is heightened at this state. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, though, is to pray for the Holy Spirit. Some of, you, some of you watching this, you may have never prayed that prayer because you maybe never really received uh, the love and forgiveness that Jesus Christ has offered you. And so you don't even know that that's a prayer you should ask for. Say, God, can, can I have your Holy Spirit? Well, you can ask that by saying, Jesus, I, I want to give my life to you in the midst of this tumultuous time. In the midst of all my fears and anxieties, I want to give my whole life to you and put it in your hands. And Jesus promised us when we do that, he'll give us the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. who is the counselor, mm -hmm. who will remind us of everything that Jesus said, mm -hmm. lead us into all truth, convict us when the time is needed to be convicted. It's an amazing thing. So if you're here today and you're like, I, I feel like never before have I, have I needed Jesus, but I sure need him now. Mm -hmm. um, I know we've come to that point in our lives before we were we earlier on in our lives that we need Jesus. And he then gave us his Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, if, that's not, if that's you, we'd love for you to, to receive Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit because he, he, what Jesus promises, there's fruit of the Spirit. Well, Paul talks about it. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. Mm -hmm. And it's gentleness and it's faithfulness. It's the things that we need right now. The Holy Spirit will do that. The other thing that's amazing about the Holy Spirit is that right now we're probably all asking a lot of questions like what's going to happen next? What do we do? Uh, looking for guidance and leadership. And, and quite frankly, I know, Ryan, you and I always feel like, I don't know if we've got all the answers. We don't. Right. We don't have the answers. But we know who does. Mm -hmm. And if we as a family can be leaning in on the Holy Spirit, if we can be saying, uh, those of us who have the Holy Spirit, saying, Spirit, fill us. Mm -hmm. so that we know how to make decisions today, so that we know how to serve sacrificially and how to think about our money right now and how to think about our time and how to think about our loved ones and our, our, our health, the Spirit will, will guide us. He will be the one, and He will be the only one that can truly guide and lead us through this time. And so I'd ask that we would be doing just that, that we would be seeking to pray boldly, to, uh, to ask uh, for the Spirit if you've never done that and to be, uh, to be asking to be filled with the Spirit if you have, that He would continue to fill us. Uh, that we'd be ready to, to share and not hoard. That we'd be ready to serve and not be selfish. We'd be, be ready to, to sacrifice. Yeah. So, so that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're, where we're at today. And yeah. that's what we're hoping for. Any other thoughts on that, Ryan? No, just, just amen. And so what we would like to do at this point in our gathering is, as Troy said, we're not going to have all the answers, but we know the one who does yeah. and who's going to lead each of us uh, through the spirit who, if we've placed our faith and trust in Jesus, lives inside of us. And so what we want to do is you're, you're going to see a couple prompts on your screen as we continue that are going to lead you through a guided prayer time of just to come to God with what you're feeling, with what you're thinking, with what you're anxious about, with what you need to give to him, with where you need wisdom, with what you should do next. And you, after you follow those prompts, we'll, we'll come back on and continue our time in worship.
So we were praying that that was a fruitful time with fruit of the Spirit. What we wanted to do is do a, another song. So at this time, uh, you'll see come across your screen a song. Uh, it is one of my new favorites. It is so rich. Uh, it's from Scripture, uh, and it's about how all the things that we are able to do or going to do, it's really not us. It's not us doing it. It's Christ in us. And so this song is called, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. So let's sing this song together.
So as, uh, before we sing our last song, we wanted to give you time to do another thing. Uh, you had some time to pray, pray before. We, we talked early on and you, dis- you had a chance to discuss some things. What we want you to do is, we want to give you another question kind of to think about as, as we end, as we mm-hmm. close. And as a group, you can do this individually uh, as well. But th- the question that we want to ask is, um, how, is the, how, how is the Spirit calling you and leading you to, to respond in the midst of what's going on? We want you to be thinking about that. We want you to be talking about that and say, what does it practically look like uh, in your context to do, to do that? Mm-hmm. So we want to pause here. We're going to put the question up. Have you spent some time, uh, take as much time as you need, and uh, think through that question as, as far as what is the next step that we and you can take individually as the Spirit is leading you uh, to respond to the situation we're, that we're dealing with now. And, and lastly, we're going to do one more song. You want to introduce it, Ryan? Yeah, the song's entitled, I Will Look Up, and uh, really is a song of allegiance and a posture of dependence, looking up to God uh, for um, help, for peace, for calm in the midst of these times, rather than looking for ourselves to control and figure it out. So we invite you to join us in your homes in singing, I Will Look Up.
So Kettlebrook family, our, our prayer would be that as we leave our homes or leave this time together, that we would go out, that we would scatter to our workplaces, that we would scatter to our neighborhoods, that we would scatter in our friendships and our family and our relationships, and that we would lead courageous lives that turn from fear and turn in faith to our King and do what he tells us through his spirit. God bless.